My humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran, Sri Sankaran, Guru Piran Nyo, fellow Nyanis. Um, we've been covering different schools of thought. And in those different schools of thought, we have been discussing about how um, the fundamental principles that uh, guide these different schools of thought. And part of the different schools of thought is that how they see the world, how they see reality. And uh, we see that in the last satsang, we spoke about um, the school of thought, which had belief systems that are anchored on secondary information, information that is passed on. Uh, and uh, interestingly, in that belief system, uh, most people, uh, there are two aspects in the belief system. One is that you have the achara mm -hmm. rituals. And then there's also in the, within the belief system, there is vichara, which is introspection, contemplation, reflection, and meditation. And we see that in most belief system, a majority of people just uh, take it as passed down information, but a very rare, a very small group that actually uh, go deep down to try to understand the rituals or the prayers. And uh, we see that from that group, there is very small group. There is a smaller subset that essentially uh, understand the essence of those rituals in a much more deeper way. And from that small group, there is a smaller subset that actually experience it. And, and from that subset, from that group, you have a much more smaller subset that is able to pass, is able to articulate that knowledge and pass it to others. So we see that um, the rare few are the ones who are like Mahans and the great saints that push all the way. In that process, they see that <clears throat> they start off with uh, which, uh, achara, which is rituals. And the rituals give them, um, you know, deeper meaning. The mind goes much more deeper in trying to understand. And the search for truth starts externally and eventually it gravitates towards an internal search for the truth. And we see that as, we, as they dwell down to that achara, to the vichara, you see that automatically the sense of rational thought, the sense of scientific knowledge, unbiased, you know, unblemished perspective, and the perspective of an experience, first-hand experience takes place. And you see that there's a beautiful convergence between both starting off the acharas and the vicharas, and ultimately they become one. It becomes a first-hand experience. So we see this in great saints, great masters, great pro prophets, and including Mahan. And when one puts to practice this footprints that they have left, you, you'd experience this yourself. You would experience that, that external cosmos that you are seeing is actually the, the link of the external cosmos starts with within all of us. And this is what that inner journey that this great saints teaches. So this is the schools of thought, and you see that the convergence of the different schools of thought, though the practices, though the rituals, though the you know, external form may be very different, the inner pursuit or the foundation or the inner you know, uh, spiritual link is one. Somewhat like the trees that I showed you, that the external trees, the leaves, the fruits may be very different. The roots look similar, but the source that all of them are touching is the same. So in this same process, what is it that made a difference that these great saints were able to push further that other ordinary people do not do it? And this is what I was really curious in my own journey, that how is it that you know, Mahan is able to get to the essence of it? What was the footprints that he left behind that it is not about the feeling that vibration or feeling that good feeling or you know feeling that that you know really uh, the the blissful feeling but what is it that gave them that expanded knowledge that this experiential knowledge that others could not get it 
you know, what is it that enable Mahan and very few masters to not only experience it, but also share that experience with others? What is the essence of that DNA of that mind? And that is what I was very curious, right? Because it is not about the end of the journey. You know, it is about the journey. But the important thing is that how do we take the first step towards that journey? And what is the roadmap, that journey that we need to take? And if we can understand that, then I think pretty much everything else becomes uh, very trivial. And that's what the, the Mahan was very curious. You know, if you see Mahan was uh, at a very young age, he was asking, me, asking you know, is there God? And if there is, can you show me the way? So he's asking, how do I get there? He says, tatparate. He says, you know, that abode that I'm trying to reach, you know, yeti yeti. He says, I'm attempting to get there. I'm pushing, you know, to get there. I'm, I'm thirsting to get there, right? You know, utu, utu. he says, I intensify that looking intensively, you know, within myself, within externally, you know, so that intensity that enabled him to link between the inner and the external cosmos. What is it that made that leap? What kind of mindset that we need to have? And that's what I'm going to show you how this Mahan showed the stages of Jnana. And if at all, if you learn these steps, you will see that no matter what you do, uh, you'll be able to unlock the secrets. You know, whether it is, you know, you're studying for medicine or whether you're studying for law, or whether you're studying for economics or whether you're studying for your own self-discovery, including the reality, that footprint was left behind in, in this I God book. So, and this is where Swamiji talks about, he talks about thinking very, the concentration, the intuition, the understanding and the realization. There is a stage. I spoke about this. I want to go a little bit more in, in depth on how we actually do it. Actually, it is inbuilt in us. The DNA is inbuilt in us. But because we are not looking at the process of how we think, how we form thoughts, how we translate those thoughts, which is a measure of experience, into knowledge, and how do we use that knowledge to transform into wisdom, knowledge that we can understand not just the reality outside, but the reality within ourselves, that how we cognize this material world and our own self. So we see this stages that Mahan left behind. And I also spoke about this spiritual compass. This, by the way, is the kind of a DNA that Mahan has left behind, but the spiritual compass that brings everything together is this you know notion of having a belief system of the self that is something far greater than our own biology and this notion of rationality question everything ask question why is this like this how is this like this when is this like this why is it i did not get it now i got it right so one needs to to understand why our mind could not understand it and why our mind can understand it. what's that journey from not understanding to understanding and that's what today's satsang is is that if i can understand the journey of why my mind could not understand why my intellect could not connect and what was the step that made that if you can understand that and you continuously build that you see that the process of you know, Swamiji's meditation, meditation, Swamiji becomes very clear. But one needs to clearly, a key principle behind this is that to question everything, you know, to introspect on everything, never take anything for granted. The day you take something for granted that, you know, somebody said something and you take it, that becomes dogmatism and you see that it is difficult then for you to proceed. One needs to understand why this is said, what's the rational behind this. When you're convinced there's a rational, uh, you know, uh, that justifies this, then it becomes part and parcel of your wisdom knowledge. 
So, so I spoke about this belief system and you see that when we would take that mindset, you see that something is very clear. Swamiji said, Telivan and Nele. You see, when you understand something really well, you are able to explain it very well. When you don't understand it, it is hard for you to explain, right? So that is why, you know, when concepts of God or concepts of self-realization or concepts of Yiru, one would know whether somebody understands that or not, because if you understood it, you're able to articulate that. If you have experienced it, you're able to articulate that. For example, suppose you have never visited a place, visited a place. Suppose you think of this way, that you have, you know, you, you are visiting, you want to know something about going to the Himalaya mountains, and you've never been. You've seen it in books, you've you know, seen it in movies, and you're trying to explain somebody who doesn't know anything about Himalaya mountains. You can probably give a theoretical understanding of what that is. But until and unless you climb the Himalaya mountains, experience that altitude, experience that acclimatization of your body to the altitude, experience the frostbite, experience all those things until you hit the summit and you get that, wow, the beautiful feeling and you come back down. That experience, you can articulate, hey, this is what this feeling is. Every step I took up the mountain, this is what my feeling is. You see, there were moments I had fatigue. There were moments I was, you know, I felt exuberant. So you see that when you experience this, you can actually explain this very well. And that is why we see that this self-realization process is also very similar. That if you experience this journey and you experience this blissful feeling, the expansion, you are able to explain this in a simple way. And this is why Swamiji, you see that many people have written about Kundalini and all those things. But this Mahan is able to explain. You know, he says, Summa irukum sugam. He says, Surudi no sasta veda madangar elam suruki solundri adeki surimonem karan the summa irukum sugam. He says that everything that is described in all the scriptures, you see, I have experienced that journey by bringing understanding that inner force in me and to experience that blissful feeling, the natural blissful feeling in me. So he's able to describe that in a very simple way. Right? And this is where the convergence of, if you just take on to the dogmatic belief system, it will be very theoretical. You need to be able to combine this. And this is where we see that when you do that properly, there are no gaps between, right? There are no, in, in this case, you have a subset of that knowledge, some understanding that reality, but you see that when you push that even further, you get a more wholesome understanding of, okay, this is a belief system and this is the inner search. And here is where I combine and I can get that better understanding of what the scriptures are saying and what my own experience is. You see the convergence between the concept of God in its universal form, the concept of you as a biological being, and nature as you know this four-dimensional universe that we live in, all converges to become one reality, not two, one reality. So how is this? How did Mahan get this experience? What did Mahan do? What do the great saints do? It started off with a process of our mind, understanding our mind, you know, and I've always been curious of what Mahan's mind is. How, how did he come up? He never went to school. He never got formal training. He just was interested in this pursuit. And, and this is the amazing part is that Without going to school, formal school, universities, postdoctoral centers, he was able to understand the processes of the mind, how they, what the experience means, what consciousness means, what this reality means. So, what is it that 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 we can learn from this man? So, I spoke about you know there are things that we know very well, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail because this is the footprints of one, the footprints of how one acquires the understanding of one's own reality and how 
that process helps you in everything and anything that you do. If you can pursue this journey, you see that whatever you study, whatever you, you introspect will become so clear. But you need to be, you know, putting in that effort to map this out. So I'm going to speak about these four concepts that I got from Mahan's book on what he was doing step by step in the earlier part of, you know, he spoke about, you know, the stage development. So I'm going to take you through this journey of the stages of Jnana. Let's look at how we learn. You know, all of us are what I call quantum knowledge. You know, we are a packet of knowledge. Everything in this universe is a packet of knowledge. Scientists call quantum of energy or quantum of knowledge. You know, energy, knowledge, vibration, whatever we call it. So I'm going to say that we are actually a quantum of knowledge because intellect or intelligence, there is a cosmic intelligence in everything. Otherwise, you know, we see that, you know, the existence of universe, the existence of cells, the existence of forces, you know, the existence of, you know, all these different types of forces would have no meaning at all. So we are part of this cosmic intelligence. So in all of us, we have this knower. We, there are things that we know. I'll give you a simple example of this. <clears throat> when conception took place, right? When conception, when, when our parents got together, when conception got, took place, you see that there was a race. This is the grand race that took place that many of the, 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 the sperms were racing to fertilize the egg. The question then is that what was behind them that made them fertilize egg? There must be a cosmic intelligence. And the mere fact that all of us are here means that we were the successful ones that managed to fertilize the egg and the whole process, the chain process took place, the meiosis and the mitosis process that form cell replication. And we had, this is the physical form of our body. So think about it, you know, all of us are packed with that intelligence. Nature's embedded us with that intelligence. So there are things that, you know, that are inbuilt in us. Another classic example is that, you know, when we, uh, you know, mature, you know, our mothers eat the food and good food, nutrition, the body grows. The mother just eats and nature takes care of everything else. But you see that when the child is about nine, 10 months, automatically you see that time to leave the mother's womb and come to the, you know, the material world. So there's a contraction. Mother cannot do anything, right? It, has, it happens naturally. So it's natural means nature. Nature has embedded that intelligence in us. So we are that quantum of intelligence, right? Never forget that. So embedded in us that, that intelligence. So here it is. So there is something within us that we know that we know we have to do this. We have to go through this evolution. And the same thing you see that the child is two, three months, the child flips. So there's an intelligence that makes the child flip. Different types of motion, standing up, walking. And this process, nature is inbuilt in all of us until our own faculty of thinking and, you know, starts taking place, we are always guided. We are always, you know, you can say mentored by nature, then eventually our parents, and ultimately we take over. So there are things that we know. So as our own faculties take shape, we know what we need to do. And part of the knowing is actually learning from that environment. So many things that we know is taught to us by our parents. Many things we learn from that environment. For example, when I was a young boy, uh, I remember my older brother telling me that, you know, there was those days, you know, you had the fire, which is made out of, uh, you know, uh, uh, coal. And he was telling me, why don't you go and touch it? It looks so nice and red. He would not touch it. He asked me to go and touch it. Unknowingly, you know, I 
without knowing what the implications I went and touched it. Of course, I got burnt and, and I learned. So the next time he asked me to go and touch it, I said, no, I'm going to get burnt. So there was a learning that took place, right? So we know things by others teaching us. We know things by ourselves experiencing this material world. And we see that there are things that we know how it works. So for example, another example I want to give you is that we know that if you displace yourself from a distance and if nothing else holds you, you will drop. Before you know, uh, gravity was discovered, we don't know what that was. We knew it happened, but we don't know what. But we learned in our science class, this is what gravity was. Newton is the one who characterized gravity. So now we know, yes. So there are knowledge that is embedded in us that we know that this is how that phenomena work, or this is the principle behind this phenomena. And we should not forget this, and this is where this rationality and the, the scientific thinking comes in, right? And this is what Mahans and all do. They, they observe things very, very carefully. You know, one of the things I learned from Mahan is that when he was living in our home, he would get out and in the morning walk, you know, around the neighborhood, walk around the garden and observing nature. The same thing he used to do in the evening. He used to observe things very carefully. He used to observe people's behavior very carefully. He used to observe people very carefully. And then he would be able to, to, to characterize and understand the people or the things around him. So part of the jnana stage is to have that attentiveness, that utru, utru, noka, noka, with the things around us. The ability to be able to discriminate between what is real and unreal. And this is something that many of us lose out as we carry on in our day-to-day -day activities. You know, we're so busy with doing things that we lose this attentiveness, this focus, right? And so the part of knowing something fully requires that intensity. And that intensity starts with us focusing some time on ourselves and enabling the mind to be focused, enabling the mind to be more quiet so that when we do that, you know, when we have our breakfast, we get the full experience. When we're driving, we see the gardens and we see the trees magnify. Before we would just drive and we don't, we have missed all the sceneries. But now your senses become more attentive. It's bringing full information to you. And this is how we know things. And that knowing process is very important to know the knower. So this is what many of us know. There are things that we know. Sometimes it's very limited understanding. And Mahans and others know about this. Okay, this is what I know, but is it complete? Is it wholesome, right? And how do I know if something is complete or wholesome? Well, I have to then study. I have to do research. I have to ask experts, is my understanding correct? You know, this cross-referencing is very important. Right? So this is part of that learning process. It's true for anything that we do. The second aspect is that this is something that we know. There are things that we know. Okay. And we know when we say no means it's not secondary information or dogmatic information. We know there are principles that guide this. Rational behavior, rational uh, you know, justification for this behavior. Right? The second aspect is that there are things that we know, we don't know. You know, I may know how to use the car, but I don't know how the car operates. What are the mechanism behind the car? So using it is different from knowing. So I may know how to, you know, operate in this life, but I don't know what my life is about. I don't have the meaning. So sometimes you see that we're doing things, but we don't know what we are doing, why we are doing, and what it actually really means. And this is where we see that most of the ritualistic approach to, to prayer or even meditation, you know, I ask people, what do you do? Oh, I sat down for half an hour, very nice feeling. And I asked the question, so what? Nice feeling? What does it lead to? Right? So, so we know 
that there are things that we don't know really well. You know, we may know partially. So the question then is that how do we then, you know, if we know that there are things that we don't know and that don't know part is very important for us, you know, and it, 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 it completes us, it completes our knowledge. And this is what most people uh, say, well, you know, I'm not getting my vibration today, so it's okay, I'm gonna try some, some other day. If I don't understand something, okay, tomorrow, and the tomorrow never comes, right? So there's a lot of procrastinating. procrastinating. So, and Mahan always says, you know, that, that search for knowledge and the search for this introspective, uh, you know, whatever you don't understand is that he says, that means without letting go, you've got to pursue it until you get that full knowledge. So that requires one to search and seek. What is it that we don't know? Why am I not feeling it? And, and there are times that when it's so important, you, sh you know, it, it really troubles you that you cannot sleep, that you have to get up and discover it. And once you discover it, then you can go back to sleep. So that intensity Mahan had, you know, the search for, you know, that knowledge. Swamiji used to say, you know, kudal pasi, udal pasi, ullatin pasi. He says that, hunger and the thirsts for this you know when you're really really hungry when somebody gives you something a simple food you feel wow or when you're really thirsty and somebody gives you you know some water the first taste you know really nourishes you in that same way when we don't know something and that intensive knowledge that search the ullatin pasi one needs to search and seek when you search and seek, you see that you may not discover it, but something, a guru or a guide or somebody will come and say, okay, let me show you the way. And this is what happened to Mahan. You know, he was thirsting for this knowledge. You know, someone as a guide came and said, look, you know what? I know what you're searching for. Let me just show you a simple way. So we see that when we search and seek intensively, maybe not today, Maybe not tomorrow, but one fine day that don't know will transform to becoming knowing. You see, whatever concepts or phenomena or things that you did not know through this intensity of searching and seeking, one will discover it. So we see this across in history, right? You know, uh, we may miss it, we may make mistakes, but there comes a stage we will discover it. You know, there is a nice story of Thomas, Thomas Elva Edison, right? He was trying to discover a light bulb, put fire in a glass bulb. He tried so many times, he burned his laboratory, but he never stopped. And he says that, you know, after 100 times of burning his laboratory, he says that, you know, most people will give up. But he says, no, I learned that there are 100 ways not to do it this way. And finally, he discovered you know, light bulb. Now, if he did not seek that, I think all of us would be in darkness. So in that same way, I think if we don't relentlessly search, and I said, you know, persistent perseverance, that don't know will never be known. So that intensity is very important. So this is the part that most people give up. You know, they know, okay, I don't know this. I, I, want, to, I want you to reflect back how many a times that you know, you've learned, you know, uh, scriptures or you've learned things that you've asked to, to chant. You ever asked, what does it really mean? Why is it really important? But how, what, by doing this, what do I get? Right? What do I experience? Because we have never asked that question, we have never known it. The day you ask this question and you seek it, you see that the, the, the chanting, or the knowledge or the scriptures will reveal the truth to you. So this is, we see that it, this is the journey of the stages of jnana or enlightenment. Right? The second aspect is that there are things that we don't know what we know. There are, as I said to you, we are a quantum of knowledge, right? We are quantum, we are anointed with this infinite knowledge. How is it that we have missed out? And this is the part that you need to ask this. 
how is it that I missed out this? How, why is it that I can't experience that universal reality that everybody speaks about? You know, people who have experiences, you can see that, that exuberance, that inspirations in their speech and writing and, you know, why is it that I have missed out? How come I don't know that this is in me? And I reflected upon this, you know, that how is it that everything was there, right? Say so gravity was there before Newton, right? Newton, you know, uh, did not create gravity. Gravity was there before Newton, right? The question is that how did Newton discover that nobody else discovered it? Here is the story that everybody saw the apple dropping from the tree. All they did is pick up the apple, eat, and then they went back home. But Newton sat back and watched the apples drop. And he started thinking, what is it that makes the apple drop? What's the principle behind the apple dropping? And he started thinking about it very carefully. And he didn't know what it was, right? But he knew that there was a force that was there. And through deep introspection, contemplation, he started reading all the other great scientists, you know, and he discovered through this learning there is a force. So he looked at Galileo's work. He saw all the you know, things that kept the universe, the, the planets together. This is in, there's an invisible force that we don't know what this is, right? And he says that, you know, I don't know what this is, what's the principle behind this? And he started introspecting, contemplating, and he discovered the whole mathematics and the entire gravity, the three Newton's laws, and voila, the whole, you know, what was mysterious now is revealed that there is principles that guide this universe and the forces that guide this. In that same way as how Newton, we see that in all of us, there is a force or there is a knower, but we didn't know about it. You know, it was embedded in us, but we didn't know about it. As how all the other people saw the apple dropping, but the attention was to eat it, as opposed to think about the principles behind it. In the same way, all our attentions were on the material universe and the experiences and the, the fantastic feeling and the desires. We haven't stopped to ask, why am I getting this desire? Why is this sukha feeling coming here? Why is this nice feeling coming? Why am I feeling down? What is the principle behind this? We never ask these questions like the Mahans or the Newtons. So here we observe. So Newton saw Galileo's work, you know, all the other scientists before him. And he used that as a guide to see how did they, what were they discovering? In that same way, Mahan also, you know, looked at all the work, the experiences, he read all the scriptures. He understood all this. Everything I've spoken about it is even documented in the I God book, what this vibration was. And he wanted to know there is an inner vibration that I don't know, but everybody has spoken about it. And you see that when the mind was, you know, reveling and searching, and suddenly a guru or a guide shows you a simple way. See, the guide could be in the form of a mantra. A guide could be in the form of a scripture book. A guide could be in the form of a master that comes. So we see that, you know, as, that's why there's a beautiful saying, when we long for, you know, this divinity, divinity appears in the form of a guru or in the form of a scripture or in the form, some form to reveal that force within all of us. So we see that, Again, that intensity is very important. So when we don't know what we know and through that observing what others have done, learning from them, using them as a guide, using them as a mentor, and eventually you see that, you know, whatever that they've spoken about 
thought about or you know, talked about one, when you piece it together, you're able to, to get that story. That is why you see that Mahan always says that don't, you know, adore me or idolize me. He says that, you know, uh, the greatest service you can do is understand my teachings, use it as a guide, right? So in that same way, we see that when we do that, the inner force that was in us that we missed, now the attention from outside starts turning inside and we say, ah, there is something. That's how Newton discovered gravity and all the principles, you know, the law of motion, law, you know, all those things, the three principles in that same way, when we, you know, intensify our introspection, we see that the knowledge that this great master starts revealing that inner knowledge within all of ourselves. So here again, we see that, you know, what we don't know, what we know uh, can be known uh, by the guide of the guru and the teachings. And if we, find, if we, if we intensively, Uttu Trunoka, that intensive knowledge. And that is why we are spending a lot of time, you know, trying to understand this Mahan's teachings and all the other teachings, not just Advaitic, but also Dvaitic and all the other schools of thought, because in all of them, that is the thinking of revealing this, this true reality. And the last aspect is, is much more difficult, uh, much more you know, intensive. There are things that we don't know that which we have not discovered, right? And in the earlier part, we say that we don't know there is something in me. I know there's something, but I don't know what it is, right? So if I pursue it, I can find it through the guide of gurus and so on. This aspect is that there are things that I don't know that are that beyond my own understanding and realm. I don't know what's out there. So I don't even know what I don't know. This is the interesting part, is that how does one then transcend there is a vast knowledge I, that I don't know that I've not discovered. I've never, I've never comprehended it. And this is the part that is, is, is very important that our mental capacity or our intellectual capacity is linked to, um, you know, our material universe, time and space and so on. And it is limited. And it cannot go beyond that. And that is why we have difficulty understanding beyond that frequency. So it's beyond our frequency, our, our material frequency. And we don't know that anything beyond that frequency, and we don't know how to get there. Right? And this is the part that is really important. The masters, there are masters that have gone beyond that material biology to touch that formless, dimensionless, that our material mind, as long as you're in the material mind, you would not be able to cognize. And this is why, you know, you see in Swamiji's passage, he says, you know, Uttu tru noko noko iparamum apparamum ega paraparamum in nunanati. He says, through that intensive search, the intensive linking between my material universe and the universal cosmos, and finding that link and then discovering that they are the same means that transcending our own material identity, material intelligence. And this requires a tremendous stelch of a mind to be able to break the gravity of this materiality. And an ordinary human being who is conditioned in this material world will find this very difficult to break. And this is where the great Mahans are very important. I'll give you one example. You know, when I was young or meditating, first learning, I, I didn't understand all these things. And it took a Mahan to just tap, you know, just tapping what I didn't know that did not exist in me. At least that's what I, I felt something. So these grand masters have transcended this material 
you know, realm and, and, and exist in a much more higher order, are able to bring it back and bring you back to that higher order. And that requires intensity, tremendous intensity. Many masters have spoken about it theoretically. Many masters have, uh, you know, uh, written in scriptures and so on. The difference between Mahan is that he not only wrote about it, but he showed the steps how to get there, right? You know, if you read all the other books, if you read many of the books, they'll talk about this and I and all those things, which is great, you know? Only somebody at a very advanced level says, so, you know, I know what they're speaking about. But what are the steps to get there? What are the bridge to get there? And this is what the guru and the guide, that's the link between the guru and the guide, that the guide is shown you step by step. Okay, this is the first stage. You practice this within two weeks, this is what you're going to experience, right? Your mind is going to quiet, your neural networks are going to expand, you're able to, this is the second stage, and this is the third stage, you see? And he embedded an important practice which gives you the experience of that universal reality. So what I didn't know that did not have a full comprehension of it by a simple tap that experience was given. And more importantly, that experience of how using that vibration to go to the inner realm of oneself. So we see that the combination of all of that, you know, so it starts off with this, you as a person needs to start off this because you cannot come here without this. So there are things that you don't know you need to intensify. What, what is it that I, you know, if, you know, it's been spoken about this in the scripture, what does it actually mean going deep down? So preparing your mind. So when the mind is very strong in moving, transitioning from this part to that, you see that you start now realizing, hey, there are things that I know I don't know, so I need to search for it. And there are things that I don't know that is inherent in me. How do I discover that? What steps do I need to do to unlock that secrets within me? And the last step is that when you do the other two steps, you see that, hey, there are things that are beyond me. But that beyond me is beyond my biology, my mental, my intellectual, that I material in nature. How do I use that platform to transcend, to be able to see that universal reality. Without these two steps, this step is going to be a major challenge. So if you did these two steps really well, getting here becomes more easier. One would be able to understand, hey, what this Mahan is talking about, what does this first stage means? You know, how does the first stage help me? Or how does this, this I got philosophy helps me, right? So ultimately, all of, all of this will lead us to knowing the knower in all of us. So if you only did this, it's only partial, right? If you did this, it's also partial. But when you come to this final realm, you see that this is the, you know, I am that. You know, I am beyond this material biology. I am beyond something that is beyond this four-dimensional universe. And this is exactly the thinking that not just in the self-discovery, self-realization process, you take any concept, right? If you look at the concept of gravity, right? Just a simple concept of gravity, right? So now we know what gravity is. You know, in Newton's time, you know, we discovered it. Some people may not know, okay, I know, you know, I heard about gravity, but I don't know what gravity is, right? So, and why gra if gravity is so important, if understanding gravity is really important, the attraction forces a push and pull, and you want to understand the gravity of your mind, because gravity is very important in this material universe. Does it impact my material mind? Yes, it does. So if I don't understand the principle of gravity, then how would I understand the gravity of my mind that is always being caught up in this material world. How do I decouple from gravity? So one has to learn this, right? And if you did that, say, ah, there are things that, you know, I, I understand the principle of gravity, what the attraction, the push-pull forces, how does it relate to my mind? And when you then understand that, you come to, hey, 
you know, yes, it is there, but you know, is there something in me that is transcendental to that gravity pull, push pull? And this is again, you see that one can start exploring and through the guide of Guru say, Guru, you know, I understand the principle of gravity of the mind, you know, how do I break away from the gravity? Is there methods to do this? You know, we see that in rockets, you know, it has to beat the gravity of the earth to, to get to the moon. And after you beat the gravity, the forces you need is very little to get there. Is there something in my mind that can be done? And the Guru say, yes, there are ways to beat the gravity of materiality. Once you beat it, the 10 things become more simpler and the effort, it becomes effortless and frictionless. So he starts teaching you that. So this is the gravity I'm talking about. Now, the next part is that, great, I understand gravity, you know, both the material gravity and the gravity of my mind. Then the next question is that, is there anything beyond that gravity? So now you go to this realm of quantum physics or quantum analysis, which is a much more sophisticated principle than Newton's gravity. Then one would ask, hey, do I know what quantum physics is? Guru just talked about quantum of knowledge. You know, we have quantum of, what does that mean? You know, how does the knowledge, how does energy continuously change? How does, how does that quantum physics that is in the material world is related to me? I don't know that, right? How do I make that link? And the question is that this quantum knowledge that we have packets of knowledge, is it packets of knowledge? Or is it something that is far greater that we're only seeing a small aspect, but we don't see the full continuum of knowledge? Right? It comes in packets because of our mind organizes information in packets, bits and bytes. So we're getting bits and bytes of this quantum knowledge. The question then is, is it a part of a broader continuum that I'm not seeing? Right? And this is where, how do I move from the small quantum knowledge to bigger? And how do I need to break away from that materiality, the transcendental, to see that broader continuum of knowledge, which Mahan calls universal peace, actually. So we start seeing the principles of physics, the principles of the material world, you're able to relate it to in the spiritual realm. You can look at it in economic theory or law or anything. If you think it this way, you know, I'll tell you something very interesting. You will be one of the most creative thinkers because you can take a principle in this material world and you link it up to that universal reality the material concepts and ideas flourishes with great insights and have, have meaningful impact in our lives. And this is the stages of jnana that I learned from Mahan. How is it that this Mahan, very simple, humble, but yet discovered this powerful knowledge because he discovered this powerful stages of jnana, that evolution of jnana that gives a paripurnam, a complete wholesome understanding of how jnana is generated, created, nurtured, and put to practice. Mm -hmm. Sandosham. <laughs>